Welcome everyone. I hope Paul is going to uh, have the right uh, ID and I hope he has the right password. Yeah. He should. Hello. Hello, Paul Linden. Welcome. Thank Hello. you. I'm not, I'm not wearing a gi. I hope that is not too bad a sin. No. <laughs> I didn't know I'm not talking. Today. Paul, if you can move your camera down a bit so you can have a look at you. Okay, I was there you go. Now you see me in my full glory. And I don't know whether this is working, this headphone. Oh it is. It's working really well. And Paul, you can even move you can even move the, the camera down even a little bit more. <laughs> yes. Great. Perfect. Can you see us? Yes, I can. Very good. So lovely to see you, Paul. Yes, happy to be here. I, I should have worn a gi, but I've done worse things in my life than not wear a gi. <laughs> we forgive you. Thank you. That's what I needed. We have, when do we start? A minute or so? We start now, okay, as good. you like. I will just keep track on time, but I'm leaving it to you now. Okay. We do Aikido. What is key? Let's start with that. How would you define key if you were going to? It's the life force of the universe, the energy that flows through everything. Okay, it's the life force of the universe. That's interesting. How would, what, what would you do with it as a practical matter? How do you use the life force of the universe? I center myself, I can control myself, and thereby my own energy. Then by maintaining that focus and relaxed state, I can start control, manipulating the energy around me. Okay, let's try something. Everybody stand up if you wish, please. And... Ah! Stop standing up. Okay, there's a magic hand on the floor a meter, two meters in front of you. Why is it a magic pen? Because anything you write with it will come true. That could be very handy, I think. Look at the pen. Don't go, don't not go get it, but simply want the pen. It be a real feeling and not just a thought. If you really wanted the pen, what would that do in your body? What do you feel? Anything? Well, you'd, you'd feel all the tendons in your arm and your shoulder and your finger lengthen as you stretched towards the pen. Yes, that's possible. What else? Uh, your mind would become focused mm -hmm. on the pen, probably. How many of you feel a slight tipping forward, slight possibly tipping forward towards the pen? That would yeah. Be Okay. What would happen if you were down in the basement looking for something in, in an old box and you looked up and there right in front of you was a big hungry rat? What do you, you feel? Recoil. You go backwards. Yes, of course. That makes sense. So that, those are the two basic flavors of action. Avoidance or moving towards something. Notice that as soon as you have a thought with a feeling, if you, if you really don't care whether you find the thing and you don't care about the rat, and you're not interested in the pen, you say, I, I like the pen, I want the pen, yeah, I like rats, I don't like rats. If there's no feeling for, in it, there's no action commitment. But if you feel something and wish to move toward the pen or away from the rat, there will happen a slight tipping. It feels involuntary, because you, you, you may not have chosen to tip at that point, but that is the beginning of the movement of getting the pen or es escaping from the rat. Let's try something else. Raise one arm up to shoulder height, please, and then put it down. Raise it up halfway and put it down. Halfway again and put it down. Keep raising it halfway and putting it down. And at some point, the movement will be so slight that you can feel it but you can't, no one will be able to see it from the outside. 
What does that feel like when we get to that small movement? Anyone else? Well, it feels as if you're sort of suspended in that movement. Okay. Yeah. What does suspended mean? Um, it means that you could, there's a reverberation which would allow you to go in any direction, but you're in the center of that reverberation. Okay. Um, that's interesting. I don't fully understand it. Maybe we can find a way to get me to understand. Mm -hmm. What happens if you put the arm down, raise it up, put it down again? Mm -hmm. This time, don't raise your arm, but that stuff, that feeling of being raised, raise it up to shoulder height, but keep the arm down at your side. Can you do that? If you do, if you, if you, if you do something that you feel matches that description. You're much more aware of the of that side of you. Yes. By for the I mean the space over there. Right. I'm much more aware of that space than I mean something could come and sort of knock me on the head here while I'm like thinking about yeah. over there. And yeah. Does everybody experience something that they could say, I raised it up even though the arm stayed at my side? Yeah. Whatever that might be. Okay. What happens if you consciously choose to raise the arm and that stuff, that mm -hmm. feeling? What happens to the movement then? Sorry, if we do raise the arm, Paul? Yes. Raising two things, not just the arm and not just the stuff, whatever that feeling is. Yeah. Raising them both. Raising them both, yeah. If you control, you're fine, like, it's not just a movement, it's a thought. Yes, but you're combining moving the thought and the physical arm. Mm -hmm. How does that feel? Is it different in any way from just moving the arm? It's more it's like you fly. intuitive. It's intuitive. Yeah, it's intuitive. Let me see if I can it, volume up. It feels like the the energy comes slightly before the, the physical arm. Yes. And it's almost as though when I do it in, when I do it in a certain way, it's almost as though you're laying down a, a rail and the arm moves more easily because there's a rail that you smooth this path. Yeah. Like it's floating. Yes. Okay. How do you define things? This is a definition of key or energy or thought, whatever you want to call it. It's a different kind of a definition than saying the life energy of the universe. What's different about it? Uh, it's centered on the experience of the person who's yeah. involved in it. Yeah. Exactly. It, it's, 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 Body, it embodied. tells you to, how to do something. Yeah. If I tell you that um, that key is the life energy force of the universe, how does that immediately connect to something you would do or do differently? It might for some people. It never did for me, and that's why I found different ways of defining things. The experiential definition tells you how to do something. When would you use this? I can give you a couple of instances. If somebody's, um, the way I train people to feel this in, in a defensive movement, if somebody has a knife at your stomach and you do this, you're giving all kinds of signals that you're going to move. If you rehearse the movement very softly and slowly, putting the thought into the movement, then when you do it, you fire it off and it's zero to 60 with nothing in between. It's a, an economical trajectory, and you will take that trajectory very fast and very smooth. Okay, does that make sense? When I train with Aikido, or anything else for that matter, I don't ever think about universal thingies. I don't understand universal thingies. I'm not saying it's wrong, or it's just that I can't understand it. It doesn't give me a path. So if I do a, t a technique, say somebody's grasped my wrist, then I'm feeling the, the flow before I actually do the technique. And if I 
if I'm not feeling the flow, if I'm just kind of going through motions, there's nothing in it for me that will, that will get deep. If I feel the flow, then I can do things. I can practice this solo. Um, the, the role of attacker is very nice for solo practice, but you're doing something and you're, I am creating the flow, the pathway before I do it and as I do it. Does that make sense? Does that connect anything in your experience that I can tell? Yes. yes. How, in what way? I, the way I, 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 maybe use different words, yes. but I think I, 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 but I like the way you described it. It's like you lay out a track and I, I think I, I, my intention moves before, before my body moves. So I intend and I follow that pathway. Yes. Okay. What does it be? Does, I feel like I haven't seen you in a while. You have a question? You have a question? Okay. So what this style of definition add or or help? How does this does this add anything to your your understanding of your practice? Well, if you were to begin to consider your practice this way, mm -hmm. it would change your approach. Yes. Um, and you would probably start seeing, foreseeing in your mind's eye or with your hara, slightly more of where you're, where you, you're going to go or sending your intention there. I'm, I'm interested in how this works though, if for example, because I mean, when you're, when you're with a partner, you have to continually be responding to and accommodating the partner's movements as well, even though you're trying to redefine it around your own, you know, control. So I could imagine how I might intend it to go somewhere, but it's still not go there. Okay, let's try something with that. Um, what your what your point to is the difference between doing your movements at your timing and blending with the attacker's movements. Okay, try drawing a square in the air with one hand. Just draw a square in the air. Now pick a home corner, whatever corner it is. Each time you get to that corner, you will be anticipating that you're going to be turning to it. Now, don't do anything till different till I tell you. But pick the home corner, and when you get there, go in the opposite, go in the same direction, but wish to go in the opposite direction. What does that do to the movement? It makes it, Pardon? it, makes it more difficult. Yeah, of course. And does do people feel that it gets not clear and a little interfered with? Yes. That's what happens when you have two intentions at the same time. You can't do two things that are incompatible and do them both at the same time. Have you ever driven down the street, the, the light turns yellow and you, your foot wavers between the gas and the brake? <laughs> yes. Because you're trying to tell your foot to do two things. Until you tell it what to do, it just <laughs> tries to do both. So it's a very common experience that key, energy, choice, intention, operates this way but most people don't think about it that way so how do you how do you deal with the fact that you have to you have to do your flow and yet you also have to blend with the attacker well i, I need an attacker and there's nobody here but me but uh, what 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 can we do okay let me think let's stand up please and can you think of a word that summarizes for you something very unpleasant and you hope you never experience again? Say it if you can, if you choose to. Say it to yourself. And then what happens in your body as you say that? Yes. 
tense up a little. Yes. Anybody else? Breathing. So that part of the body contracts a little. Yes. You contract. Negative um, experiences involve contraction or collapse. But let's, what would happen, what, what does happen, especially to beginner? Somebody's grabbing this beginner and they may never have experienced being grabbed and being attacked before, or even worse, they may have experienced it too often and be really triggered by it. What happens in their body when they practice Aikido and um, are grabbed over and over again? They tense up. Yeah. Okay. How do we deal with that? We uh, try to explain to them, try to get them to relax and expand. Yes, that's true. So help them feel safe. Yeah, well, they won't feel safe until they can fight their way out of whatever happened to them and win. But that's somewhere down the road. Okay, what I do is I start by helping people experience and understand the contraction or collapse. Okay. When you say, well, I'll use a personal example because it's handy. I have Parkinson's. I have it for 17 years now. When I first set, got, heard the diagnosis of Parkinson's, it was, oh my God. And I spent months going, Parkinson's. <sighs> so I trained my body not to be contracting or, or giving up or shying away from it. It is what it is. But you can replace the contraction with something more useful and more comfortable. How do you, how do you create that state of open balance it's not natural to be open and balanced and kind and free when you're being attacked. It's natural to want to hit back and throw those human things which is all in trouble. How do you change that? Do you use uh, visualization? What is a visualization, please? Uh, visualize what you would ideally want. The, you visualize the outcome okay. that you would like. One of the things that I may be a little different, I, to me, I've never been able to visualize anything useful. I, I feel, I, I do something physically in my body, which may be part of what you're doing when you visualize, but let's try something. Um, what happens if you want to go forward and you, 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 you're choosing a path forward? There's something nice over there. Just before you start the, the movement itself, there's that slight choice, that feeling of energizing that direction, right? Yes. What happens? Okay, let's see. Do you have a bowtan handy? I think I have one somewhere. Yes, let me I'll be right back. Okay, this is Joe that that'll do. And if you if you raise a boat in indoors or a Joe, look around, make sure there's no lamps. Let me get a little long from here. But if I maybe I'll choke up on it, not quite the best way. If I do this, when I raise when I poke a hole in the sky, when I raise the weapon. Where does where does my attention go? Where do I feel? What direction? Where the weapon oh. is. Sorry, the back right of the hip. Here. And for beginners in particular, I teach them how to lower their attention when they raise the weapon, and raise their attention when they cut. Why? Balance. Yes. Try it. Let's see what happens. If you can try this, you can even do it just without the weapon. When I raise my arm up, it doesn't cut down. If you raise your arm and your awareness, it's possible for beginners, especially, to lose the core. If they drop their awareness and raise their awareness when they cut, they're balancing out their movement. Is that anything that you've experiment, experimented with? Yes. Good. Okay. Now, how many more directions can we move? 
You can raise the weapon and lower your awareness and send your awareness out in both directions, forward and back. Try that, please. If you can, you can do that all, all at once. If you can, let's break it down. Lock your awareness, and you can do it as a breathing exercise. Inhale and exhale down. Inhale and exhale up. Inhale, exhale to one side. Inhale, exhale to the other. And then inhale into your core, and exhale in all six directions at once. What does that feel like? That you're familiar with. Expensive. Mm -hmm. And what does it do to your movements? It uh, makes the movements fuller. Yes. Smoother. Uses up all the space. Yes, it takes up all the space. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else? Anybody have any experience that they don't care for in this? It, it also makes the movement, you know, like effortless, or what you'd have to put less effort, actually. To, yes. To achieve it. It's much more efficient. Yeah. Now, what would happen if you're, if you're sending that, en that energy, thought, intention, whatever, out in all six directions, you're balanced, somebody slaps you across the face. Well, oh, you, are, you, you would not become, you would not become locked on what had just happened to your face, which would, would open you up then to attack on other parts of your body. Yes. Well, you would, after practice, you would not become locked. The normal human thing is to lock and- To lock on it, yeah. That's why we do Aikido, mm -hmm. so we can overcome that. Okay. Questions, can you see where I'm going? Mm -hmm. This is, the, for me, the mm -hmm. translation from the physical technique in the dojo to the experience of movement, thought, interaction, off the mat outside. Questions, comments, requests? Paul, when you do the breathing, uh, do you, uh, when you do the breathing, uh, I have heard about breathing in and out, out of the whole body, like you said, breathing out, but can you also do the same thing, breathing in through all directions? You could. Why would you do that? In the same sense that when you breathe out through, through to all directions, mm -hmm. which makes my sounds very, very effortless and the centered, uh, that the, the, the same, the feeling of breathing in from all directions has the same effect. Okay, then you use it for that. I don't particularly think there are things which are 100% the same for all of us. For some people, different images, different feelings in the body will, will access different things. So of course you can breathe in and out and use each one. One of the things that I've done is use a two, it's a two stage breath. I breathe in and I open, and then I change the metaphor. I breathe out and I open. And I breathe in and I open, and I breathe out and I open. So you can use it in any way that's useful, but you have to make it clear and concrete. So what is key? Somebody said, I've heard about this Aikido stuff. What is key? How would you answer that? Conscious I mean, intent. Yeah, what I'm what I'm getting from you is that it has at least two qualities. One is the intention, and another is, in a way, the openness or they, the or the the sort of relational yes. um, aspect of it. I would say the intention is is the motor, and the shape that you project the intention. Vehicle. So if, you just, if, you, if you don't know, if you can't have the experience clearly how to project intention, you, you won't be able to do it well. Now, to me, clearly means operational concrete language. I would never describe key as the 
energy, the life force energy of the universe. He doesn't have the faintest clue what that means. It may be true, and that's what you shouldn't describe it that way. If it means something to you, then by all means use it. But I, I came up with these more concrete ways of speaking it. Do you understand anything else? Paul, could you yeah. say that again? The two parts that the intention is the uh, motor. Yes, and where yeah. you go with it is the shape of the intention or the quality. Let's try something. Um, as you stand or sit or lie, whatever is appropriate for you, think of filling your body full of a brilliant yellow. Color. Huh? Brilliant yellow. And what happens if you take in your body? Your body is a sponge that absorbs colors. Yes. What happens to your movement and your feeling if you think of taking in your whole body a brilliant sunshine yellow? Does that change anything in your experience? You feel happier. Yes. Yes. Does it rock? Uh, I think it makes it more expansive. Yes, expansive. Yeah, which goes in both ways, actually, rising and sinking. What happens if you substitute for that a cobalt blue? So a blue is sort of like my shirt, but a bit yeah. richer. What happens to your body when you substitute cobalt blue? For, for it gets more direct. Movement becomes more direct. Anything else? Yes. Um, and deeper. Yes. It goes down. Yes. I experience the temperature drops. Yes. Yeah. I think that. Okay, let's try something else. Um, have you ever felt silk, real nice silk? Silky <laughs> silk. What yeah. does your body do when you move with that feeling of silkiness? Very smooth. Yeah. Have you ever been sandpaper? Rough. <laughs> sandpaper. What happens if you take that into your body and move that way? Yes. You, you upset other people. <laughs> yes, you do. Very jerky. Yeah. It's very different, isn't it? Yes. So intentions have shapes and qualities, trajectories. They're sort of vector quantities. They have a, a direction and, a, and an intensity. What I'm talking about is the intention is the process whereby you set something in motion. But the motion, that's different. That's what you can decide to go almost anywhere. Mm -hmm. So those are the two elements that I think of in, in working with intention. And I'm not saying that life force and that sort of stuff as a description is evil or something. I'm just saying I find it more convenient for myself to control what I do and how I do it and teach that way when I use concrete language. Yes. Okay. So what, what would you do if you're doing it every night? Yeah. There are all kinds of okay, what should I do? Um okay. This is something interesting. As we walk, normally in everyday life, change this here. There we go. Normally in everyday life, we extend the, 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 the one foot and the other opposite arm. We yep. don't do this. Why? Balance. Yes. It it cancels out the rotary motion. If you put the same foot and the same arm forward, you get a swinging quality. And that's very inefficient for, for most movement. Notice, however, that much of our Aikido is that homolateral movement where you put the same hand, the same foot forward, precisely to use the swinging power. So somebody is happy, and I do it. I'm putting the same hand, the same, forward, the same foot forward, because it allows me to structure an intention which is very circular and very smooth. I think this is one of the reasons that Aikido is so difficult for beginners. It's very unnatural human movement. We don't tend to, to use that combination very much. True. That's very interesting, actually. 
let's, let's, let's continue this. Um, if somebody has my hand, and they're grabbing my left, their right, mm -hmm. and I pick up their arm, and I push them out. What is the axis of rotation there? Where are you turning and how? Is it around the midpoint of the forefoot? Midpoint of the forefoot? Sort of, at some, at some point, yes. Any, any other answers? The, well, there are several axes of rotation going yeah. on simultaneously. Yes, that's the point. And, I, I think we don't often analyze that. When you slide forward and then you turn, I'm turning around this. Yeah. Okay, and then I shift it to this side. Okay, I wish I had a partner here. I didn't know yeah. what the rules of politeness would be. But if you let's do something simple. I slide in here and I turn this way. This, okay, let's do this. Slide in, I know how to go, you've got that. You slide in, you turn around this point, and then you, you switch it to the other shoulder again. Block, what would that do? If you slide in, if I slide in and turn around this point, yep. around that point, I can do it, and I'm moving here. But if I slide in, turn on this point, then shift it to this point, then I project ah. forward with the other hand. It allows for better control. You're not just moving toward the camera, landing, and then taking charge by pulling forward, you, not with your arm, by the whole way you use your body. Mm -hmm. Is that something that people experimented with? I'm sure it is. You probably have a different way of sticks it's talking about it. So. Yes. I mean, your 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 whole arm and wrist and hand are also turning at right. the same. Right. As you do the body movement, you're rotating within um, as well. What are you doing with your head as you do that movement, please? With my head. Yes. Everybody watch your head. It's a very nice one, I'm sure. Is she doing anything with it as she turns her wrist? Yeah, I'm tilting <laughs> to oh, the I same see. direction as I'm turning my um so I'm I'm opening like out and I'm tilting in that direction. What does the tilt be? Sorry? What what effect does the tilt have? I'm doing it on purpose for a reason, or is it just happening? What's its consequences? No, I think it's the it's just I wasn't doing it consciously on on purpose. I think it was just the focus in a way, the the intention of opening. Okay. Um, your neck. Sorry? You're closing your neck. Yeah. 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 So you're opening by closing. Sounds human to me. Yeah. What? Hold on. What? Hold on. We have five minutes. Okay. Time flies when you're having fun. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? You see what I'm trying to do? Yeah. I'm trying to nail down our thinking and our speaking in concrete body based language. Then I can work with things and, and modify them if I wish. Paul, do you, do you think that Aikido movement then is natural movement or unnatural movement? Yes. So I've always thought of it as if I were trying to learn a more natural movement, but I think you're saying something else. Yes, it's, that, it's very unnatural in many ways. If somebody slaps you, our, our normal response is this, fight or flight. That's the natural response. If we, if we spend years learning to relax and feel compassion for the person who's trying to hurt us, huh. that is very unnatural. But can you fly? I can, but I use an airplane. 
the point I'm trying to make is it's unnatural for humans to fly, but with our brains, we figured out how to do it. I think compassion for the enemy is something that's very difficult. It's much easier to just hate the sucker. I think the, <laughs> the thought is unnatural, the feeling is unnatural, and the action is unnatural. And so is a lot of the movement that you can like to But it's better than natural, I think. Uh, on, on that note, um, the, the interplay with, with Ki and, and our breathing, and I, I've found as a, as a relative beginner, is that uh, I end up holding my breath and I have to constantly try not to hold my breath and continue to flow, which is also an, an unnatural movement to uh, yeah. unlearn. Right, it is unnatural. I don't think being told to control your key it never was helpful to me, so I, I don't use that language. Mm. Any other questions? What is yeah. The um, so how how does um how do you think that projecting the intention helps with the technique? How the the two help each other? You can't do a technique without an intention to move there. This is just a way of clarifying and speeding up your ability to move the intention that you want and your body. I think underlying every movement, which isn't a spinal reflex, is a decision. And you, if you're aware of those decisions, you can make more efficient decisions. Thank you. Anything else? And say, so in, in, in uh, talking about the natural, unnatural, and you know, when, when you have an actual um, attacker or an uke, I found that um, if you first don't accept the attack, and that's kind of so, sort of a conscious or, or at least um, you have to accept it in some form, otherwise you get stuck and you can't expand. Okay, and it's like, if, you know, maybe it's part of the intention. I don't know where, when, you know, when would this be part, but there has to be some sort of acceptance. Excuse me, there's less than a minute left. I'll answer your question very quickly. You're using abstract language. I don't know what acceptance is, but if you give me a series of behaviors, it's like your stomach hang loose, okay. hang loose, breathe softly, let your weight hang down. Then I know what to do, and I think that's what you mean by acceptance. Okay. Thank you, Paul, for coming so yeah. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much indeed. Be here. And if anybody right. wants, I'm always up for open emails and I've got a bunch of stuff like that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Good to see you. Yes. You so can I throw a no, can I throw a question in there? <laughs> yeah. when, when there uh, for just yes, for thought, when there is no intent, when you are in your calm, expanded state and no intent. Uh, how do you train that? And no intent? On your part or someone else's part? Oh, uh, on my part. What, what, it, I, I don't understand what you're trying to oh, uh, Is there some benefit in, in, in the, the, the state before intention, in, in the state of just being? That is a state of intention. Oh. If okay. you, if you, if you sit, and then